Welcome to today's webinar on eosinophils and parasites. As many of you know, our society has been organizing monthly webinars since the beginning of the year to honor our engagements that are summarized on this slide. The International Eosinophil Society normally organizes an in-person meeting every two years to foster exchanges of ideas and information about eosinophil biology and eosinophilic disorders among people who are interested. It appears that we will very likely have a true meeting in, in North America next summer, so in 2022. So please tune in to the IES website from time to time to be informed of the progress we are making in organizing that event. On the next slide, there are a few items related to the logistics of this webinar. If you have any questions during the meeting, you can enter them at any time in the question and answer section of this platform. Our moderator will make sure that your questions are addressed at the end of each presentation. If you have any difficulties logging uh, with the connection, try to log off and log in again during uh, your participation in the meeting. The webinar will be recorded so that you will be able to review it again or eventually share it with those who may be interested and who are not able to attend today. You'll just need to go to the Society's website where you will find a link for each webinar we have had so far. I will now leave you with our moderator, Dr. Amy Cleon, head of the human eosinophil section in the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases at the NIH. She's a longstanding member and past president of the International Eosinophil Society and has created and organized the pre-meeting workshop dedicated to eosinophilic disorders since 2003. These workshops bring together scientists and clinicians, all eosinophiles, and have consistently been highly productive. Thank you, Amy, for organizing this session and for moderating it. So thanks, Florence. I'm really excited to be here today to introduce the three speakers in this session who are going to bring us up to date on some of the newer roles of eosinophils in parasitic infection. The first speaker is Pedro Gazzanelli from the Laboratory of Parasitic Diseases just down the hall from me. And he's going to be talking about eosinophil dominated pulmonary type 2 inflammation driven by allergy um, and its effect on human larval development in the lungs. So, welcome, Pedro. Thanks so much for, for agreeing to give this talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Amy Cleon, for this nice invitation. Thanks for the society. Um, I'm very happy to to have this opportunity to present um, some of the studies that I, we have been doing here at NIH. And um, I'm going to share my screen. Before I start, can you just confirm if you can see my screen and it's all good? Yep, that's perfect. All right, thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. Um, today, uh, we're going to talk about the role of eosinophils, but looking at the interaction between uh, the allergic diseases and the helmet infection. And uh, uh, one of the reasons that we decided to study this, this uh, interaction is because there is a common feature between the, uh, the allergic disorders and the helmet infection. And one of the most interesting um, uh, common feature is, this is their association with a, a strong type two immune response. So we know that the helmet antigens and the allergens, they, they both initiate the immune response by sensing the mucosal epithelial of the host that can be either the skin, the lungs and the intestine, and that will lead to an activation of the both innate and adaptive immune response, but we know that this effector T82 cells, they play a central role for establishing this type 2 dominated environment, which will eventually result in high levels of total and specific IgE levels, and, and most importantly for this talk today, uh, uh, this eosinophil dominated environment. Uh, uh, besides MOOCs production. So, so another thing is, we know that the, the allergic disease and the helmet infection, they are two major global health concerns, which together affect more than 3 billion people worldwide. But very interestingly, there is a clear geographic distinction, as we can appreciate in, the, in this map, by the affected areas, by the allergic disease, by the allergies and the helmet infections. However, 
because of the current globalization and this extensive population movement worldwide, now there is a potential interaction between these both conditions. And um, we know that the helmets, they, are, uh, uh, they have this master capacity to downregulate the immune response against themselves and to bystander antigens. So because of that, the chronic helmet infections, they are normally associated with a diminished uh, development of allergic diseases. But what happens when allergic people get infected with helmets? What happened with the allergic sensitization precedes the, the helmet infection? And that's the central point of my talk today. And we were able to address this question working with a cohort of North American expatriates with no history of helmet infection who traveled to an endemic area for helmet parasites. And when they returned to the US and they were diagnosed with the, this common filarial um, nematode named Loa Loa and also known as the eye worm. And when we start doing a deep characterization of those individuals, we uh, uh, observe that some of them are uh, doing this immunocap theta top uh, uh, assay that they, some of them, they were also um, uh, sensitized with the house dust mite, uh, uh, presenting house dust mite specific IgE levels and some not. So we divided these patients in um, um, patients that are allergic to house dust mite and infected with filarial parasite and patients that are non-allergic and infected. And when we characterize the immune response of those individuals, we observe very interestingly that the the concomitant allergic sensitization and the filarial infection uh, 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 was associated with an increased uh, uh, total IgE levels, as well as a parasite-specific um, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13 levels, and as well as, um, and very important for this talk today, an increased numbers of eosinophils when compared to those individuals non-allergic, just infected with filarial um, parasites. So then, so we decided to investigate the plasticity and the specificity of the factor TH2 cells driven by the ancients and allergens. So working with the PBMCs of those individuals, and now we add two new controls, individuals just um, uh, allergic to house this might not infected and our healthy donor volunteers, we evaluate that the, we did a, like a multi-parameter flow cytometry experiment during a 25-color uh, T-cell panel. And on the PBMCs of these individuals is not, um, and in the presence or in the absence of antigens. And what we observed was that the filarial infection was driving a unique signature of, of T-cell differentiation when we compare with the healthy donor volunteers. So when we look more carefully to these uh, T cells on the filarial infected patients, and then when we deconvolute that those by the allergic status, we show that the allergic and infected patients they they develop this hyper reactive T cell response here characterized by the co-expression of the CD40 ligand um, and also the TH2 cytokines here represented by the IL-13, IL-5 and IL-4. So we showed that the allergy and the filarial infection was driving this increase in these effector TH2 cells when compared to the only infected patients. So uh, to summarize this first Part, we show that the filarial infection drives this distinct signature of memory TH2 cells in humans and the concomitant allergic sensitization enhanced even further this type 2 associated inflammation. So the next question was, so what's the biological relevance of this hyperreactive TH2 immune response induced by this interaction? So to answer that question, we brought this to an experimental model. So we worked with this uh, a pulmonary lung inflammation driven by the intranasal sensitization with house dust mite, followed by another helmet, a roundworm, quite common um, in the world, which is the Ascaris infection, which infect humans. And uh, the beauty of this model is that the, the Ascaris infection also affect the lungs. There is a mandatory phase of the parasite development in the lungs, and that mimics very well what happens in humans. 
And uh, so we decided to evaluate the impact of the allergic sensitization uh, at, in the nature of the ancient specificity and the allergic phenotype, as well as on the course of the helmet infection. But today, I will focus mostly in the impact of the helicidus mite sensitization in the lungs on the course of the helmet infection. Uh, uh, to evaluate the impact of the allergic sensitization on the course of the helmet infection, I brought this up uh, just to show that the Ascaris parasites in the lungs, when we evaluate the peak of the larva migration, which is around day eight, they drive this robust TH2 response represented here by this heat map where we have the levels of IL-4, 5, 6, and 13 in the lungs of Ascaris infected when compared to the lungs of non-infected mice. So this is a very nice model to evaluate this TH2 interaction uh, uh, in the lungs. Um, and uh, so to understand what was the impact of the allergic sensitization, we need to know first what is the immune response just driven by the parasite. So as we can see, when the larva leaves the, 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 the circulation and reaches the lung parenchyma, they start sensing, when they reach the, the epithelium, they start sensing this uh, uh, um, the immune response by driving this um, characteristic, characteristic TH2 response, uh, with uh, releasing high levels of alarmings, which will eventually uh, 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 recruit a lot of eosinophils to the lung tissue. But this response will not be mounted in enough time to be able to uh, control the infection. So in a primary infection, the larva will migrate th through the lung epithelium, reaching the airways in their quest to complete the life cycle. However, when we evaluate the, 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 the the presensitization with the house dust mite engine followed by the Ascaris infection, we show that the house dust mite sensitization was driving this massive inflammation, uh, inflammatory influx uh, in the perivascular and the peribronchial uh, compartments. And when we characterize this inflammation, we show that uh, this uh, inflammatory is basically constituted by uh, eosinophils, and uh, we also show elevated levels in the tissue of IL-13 in the Hulsdus mite sensitized animals followed by the Ascaris infection when compared to the only Ascaris infected mice. Uh, and when we look at the impact of this uh, Hulsdus mite sensitization on the course of the helmet infection, very surprisingly, we showed that Hulsdus mite was driving this huge protection against the, the larval uh, 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 migration. So we saw that uh, there was a 70% decrease in the parasite burden in the, in the animals that were pre-sensitized with house dust mite in comparison to the non-allergic. And what not just in numbers, when we look at the larval actually migrated through the allergic mice, we saw a completely uh, a massive impairment in the development of the larva as we can see here when compared with the larva that migrate in non-allergic mice. So with that, we conclude that the eosinophil dominated pulmonary type 2 response driven by the sensitization limits the parasite burden in the lungs. So the next question, so what's the role of the eosinophils actually? So, um, so we, we did exactly the same model inducing allergic sensitization, but now in the uh, eosinophil deficient mice in this double GATA animals. And uh, one, the, one of the first phenotypes that we observed that when we deplete the eosinophils in the house dust mite sensitized mice, basically we diminish considerably the levels of the IL-4, suggesting that in this type 2 lung inflammation, the eosinophils are major sources of the IL-4 that helps to establish the inflammation, but most um, importantly for this talk is that uh, when we look at the parasite burden in, in allergic the eosinophil deficient mice, the, the house dust mite sensitization was no longer able to control the infection or uh, to impair the larval development as we can appreciate in this figure. Uh, so, the, uh, so we move on and then we wanted to know how does the allergic sensitization promote the eosinophil dominated reduction in the helmet flow of numbers. So we decided to look at the differentiation of these effector TH2 cells. So to uh, address that question, 
So we did an experiment where we basically use neutralizing antibodies. We deplete the CD4 before and during the allergic sensitization. And, and what we observed was that in the animals that we deplete the CD4 T cells before and during the allergic sensitization, they were not able to control the infection as the animals that receive the isotype control. And the very interesting, when we deplete the CD4 after the allergic sensitization, but before the infection, nothing happens. And then and both groups that receive the isotype control and, and, and the neutralizing antibodies uh, that they were sensitized with house this might both were able to control the infection. And the reason for that is when you deplete the CD4 before the establishment of this TH2, uh, uh, allergic driven TH2 environment, there was a massive numbers of uh, xenophils in the ones that receive isotype control. And the ones that we deplete the CD4, they were not able to create this xenophilic environment. And uh, when we deplete after the allergic sensitization, both presented these uh, elevated numbers of those xenophils. So uh, we knew that the CD4 T cells were playing an important role. And we also showed that the CD4 are major sources of IL-5 and IL-13 by flow cytometry. So we really wanted to understand what's the role of the IL-5 and IL-13 signaling in promoting this xenophil pulmonary type two immune response. So we're starting to look at the role of the house dust mite specific IO5 producing CD40 cells. We developed this very interesting but simple experiment where starting from two different donors mice, one wild type and one IO5 full knockout. So we got, we purified the CD40 cells from the spleen of those animals. And once we enriched the CD40 cells, one capable to produce IL-5 and one not capable to produce IL-5, we transfer them back to TCR alpha deficient mice. And then we let them to restore. And we did our model of inducing allergic sensitization by house dust mite and follow it by the Ascaris infection. And when we look at the parasite burden of these uh, different groups, what we observe that only the animals that received the CD4 T cells from wild type mice were able to control the numbers of larvae migrating in the lungs. The animals that received the CD4 T cells that cannot make IL-5, they have very similar levels of as the non-allergic mice. And we observe that the one of the potential explanation is because uh, uh, when you have CD40 cells not able to produce IL-5, you cannot generate this eosinophil dominated type 2 immune response in the lungs. So then we moved to the, understand the role of this IL-13 signaling and uh, uh, driven by the allergic sensitization. And very uh, uh, briefly, and to understand the role of the IL-13 thinking, we need to look at the receptors. So basically there are two main receptors for the IL-13, the high affinity receptor, also known as the IL-13 receptor in alpha-2, uh, um, which is um, also known as the decoy receptor. So when the IL-13 binds on, the, on this decoy receptor, there is no signaling. However, there is a functional receptor that normally form dimers with the IL-4 receptor on alpha, named IL-13 receptor on alpha-1. And when the IL-13 binds on this receptor, there is signaling through the STAT-6 and normally all the transcriptional profile of this, this, the cells activated, they, they uh, leads to a TH2 phenotype. So by playing with the, the receptors, we can control the levels of the IL-13. So using IL-13 uh, receptor alpha-1 deficient mice, basically we block the role of the IL-13 in the animals. So uh, when we compare our model using wild type and IL-13 receptor alpha-1 mice sensitized with house dust mite followed by the Ascaris infection, we got a very interesting result. So uh, the role of the allergic sensitization in wild type mice, we already know that massive protection uh, that leads 70% reduction in the numbers of larva. However, the allergic mice um, that are IL-13 receptor alpha-1, they are no longer able to control the 
the larval migration. And uh, uh, there is a, 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 and it's very interesting because these animals, they behave very similar as the allergic eosinophil deficient mice, suggesting this crosstalk between IL-13 and eosinophils. And when we want to address that uh, 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 question, if the IL-13 and the eosinophils are uh, communicating, uh, we show that the, in fact, the animals that they are allergic, but IL-13 receptor now for one deficient, they cannot drive this eosinophil dominated uh, inflammation in the lungs. And a potential reason for that is because the absence of IL-13 signaling driven by the allergic sensitization is not capable to promote elevated levels of the major chemokines that promote the recruitment of the eosinophils to the lung tissue, as we can see here in the levels of eotexin-1 and eotexin-2 completely ablated on the uh, allergic uh, IL-13 receptor alpha-1 deficient mice, suggesting that the IL-13 signaling through the IL-13 receptor alpha-1 in the lung epithelia driven by the pulmonary allergic inflammation triggers an eotexin-mediated eosinophil-dependent lung-specific larval killing. So, um, so we really want to know how the eosinophils are or were uh, uh, controlling and arresting the larval development. So, but if, um, instead of looking at the eosinophils and on what they were doing, we decided to look at the larval parasites and see how do they behave in the presence in, in an environment with eosinophils or in an environment without eosinophils. So we decided to look at the transcriptional profile of the Ascaris larva during their lung migration in non-allergic and also in, in house this mite allergic mice. And what we observe, uh, just remember we have these four groups of larva. So animals, larva that migrate in non-allergic mice that develop normally, no, larva that migrate in uh, allergic mice that have the numbers and the development completely, completely impaired. And we also have larva that migrate in non-allergic and allergic eosinophil deficient mice. And we can see a normal uh, development in, this, uh, um, in those parasites. So when we did the RNA-seq analysis in these four sets of larva, we show very clearly that only the larva that migrate in wild-type allergic mice, they have a completely distinct transcriptional profile when compared with the others, as we can see in this principal component analysis, as well as by this gene expression heat map here, uh, uh, as we can see here in this first column, the animals, the larva that migrate in wild-type allergic mice. So we really want to understand what is driving these differences in, 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 in the transcriptome of those larvae to try to understand how the allergic sensitization was impairing, arresting the larval uh, develop, developmental program. Uh, uh, so what we observe using this, uh, uh, the first data that we got from the RNA-seq analysis was looking at this Ascaris and stage specific RNA-seq data we showed that uh, uh, the larvae that were migrated in wild-type allergic mice, they were showing a, a transcriptional profile of L3 liver-specific uh, 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 parasites. So these are, are the, the stage that precede the lung, uh, uh, in the lungs, the lung migration. So uh, suggesting that in fact this this larva they were with the, the development and complete arrest. On the other hand, the larva that migrate in, in wild-type allergic mice, they were not showing the signature genes for the L3 lung stage and the IL-4 intestine-specific uh, uh, gene, suggesting that the Ascaris larva recovered from house dust mite allergic lungs, they have a molecular signature of still liver stages. And just to summarize, the, all the RNA-seq data here and try to bring the association with eosinophils, the larvae that migrate in wild-type mice, in, in non-allergic animals, where they develop normally, 
in the lungs that has approximately uh, approximately two percent of eosinophils, and the larvae that have a completely uh, impairment in the in the development in the allergic mice, they which present around thirty five percent of eosinophils. So we showed that ab around thirteen hundred genes that were differentially expressed um, when we compare the the RNA seq data from them, and very interestingly. When we compared the animals that they were uh, non-allergic and allerg the larvae that migrate in non-allergic and allergic mice, we show that the allergics uh, would both present 0% of eosinophils. They, there was only 31 genes differentially expressed. And in two allergic environments, uh, one in, with eosinophils and another one without eosinophils, we showed that basically all the different genes that were driven the impairment were also present and the when we have a uh, allergic environment but one with eosinophils and the other without eosinophils so what we did we uh, identified the highly downregulated genes in the larva that were the development suppressed by the eosinophils and we got the highly upregulated genes of the larva that migrate in allergic mice but with no eosinophils. And very surprisingly, we showed that most of these genes, they are common. And um, now we are looking at this uh, based on the annotation of the genome of these parasites that, that we have in our lab. We show that the, the, a lot of uh, class of, of functions from these genes, they are impaired, perturbed by the presence of eosinophils. But now we are very interested to look at this group of genes associated with the metabolism of the parasite. And just to highlight where we are now, one of these genes that is completely suppressed in the larva that migrate in allergic mice uh, with a, a, a completely eosinophil dominated uh, inflammation in the lungs, is a gene associated with the amino acid metabolism, which is the niprolysin. And very interestingly, niprolysin, which is a very conserved protein, has been um, uh, studied uh, uh, in a different uh, helminth parasite, which is the hookworms. And it's one of the potential vaccine candidates uh, uh, against the hookworm infection in experimental models. So we believe that with these mRNA seq profiles, Sorry. Uh, we want now to use this uh, RNA seq data to, to identify gene products crucial for the larval development that could be used as a potential target for prevention of chronic infection, as well as to understand the developmental biology of Ascaris uh, parasites. So, with that, I would like to thank. Uh, uh, um, all the people that helped me with this project, starting by my supervisor, uh, Tom, Dr. Tom Nutman, and all the members of the Nutman lab, all the students that were involved in this project, and all the collaborators at, at NI8, and, and, and also the collaborators in Brazil. And um, thank you again for this opportunity. I'm happy to take any question. So thanks very much, Pedro, for that wonderful talk. We're a little bit tight for time, um, but there are a few questions, quick questions I think that can be answered in the chat. And then others that have questions, I encourage you to contact Pedro. I know he's very available and will answer things by email and whatever. Um, so the first question came from Judah Denberg. Um, he said, terrific talk and model. Is the IL-5 from T cells driving eosinophilia via chemoattraction? or via eosinophilopoiesis in the bone marrow? So that's a, that's a, a very interesting question. And um, we show that uh, we never look at the, the chemokine levels in this uh, IL-5 deficient uh, uh, CD4 T cells. But what we, the, 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 the hypothesis that we are working now that you have, you need two moments. So the IO5 producing CD40 cells working by inducing the proliferation of these eosinophils um, um, in the bone marrow and the chemokines driven by the IL13 signaling in the lungs are actually inducing these um, increased levels of chemoattractants to bring these eosinophils from the periphery to the lung tissue to drive the, this type 2 inflammation. 
And then one last question from Magdalena. I'm going to butcher her last name. I'm very sorry, Tubala. Um, she says, hello, I was wondering if you investigated if the effect of the allergic sensitization is long lasting. If mice were infected with aspirus two weeks post allergic challenge, would the effect on helminths be the same or diminished? Yes, we did that. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to present that. So um, we did, and um, um, so we what we did, we induced the allergic sensitization, drive this massive inflammation in the lungs, but we wait for 20 days when the levels of the inflammation return to baseline, and then we infect it with ascaris um, parasites. And what we observed that even that uh, when we, uh, the, the protection against the infection was exactly the same by infection during the peak of the inflammation. So those pre-sensitized animals, they mount the response re really faster than the non-allergic mice. So uh, it's still protecting and that's the answer. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was a wonderful talk. I think we need to move on to talk number two. Thank you so much. So our second speaker is Seng Li. Um, he's a staff scientist in the intracellular parasite biology section. Many of you were probably not anticipating that you would hear about non-worms. Um, and Seng is gonna talk about localized circuitries in cutaneous leishmaniasis, a protozoan parasite that allowed dermis resident macrophages to maintain M2-like properties in a strong TH1 environment. Thanks so much, Seng. Uh, okay, thanks for nice introductions. Okay, can share. So you can see my screen. Yes, looks fine. Okay, as Amy mentioned, first, I thanks for Amy to give me a chance to present my data in this wonderful EOSFL community. So, uh, uh, as Amy mentioned, I'm going to talk about how this uh, dermis resident macrophages uh, uh, manipulate these uh, local immune circuitries uh, to maintain their M2-like properties in, in TH1 environment after infection. So we generally really believe that uh, the macrophage population in the tissues is continuously uh, replaced by a monocyte from bone marrow. But however, uh, the recent series of studies show that uh, they are actually embryonically seeded from yolk sac or fetal liver during embryogenesis and then self-maintain themselves. So for example, microglial cells uh, from brain, lung iron cells from epidermis, alveolar macrophage, Cooper cell, all of them uh, differentiate uh, during embryogenesis. So next, we try to identify these the resident cells, resident tissue macrophages in the, in the skin. So we did a, a skin analysis using flow cytometry. So I stain CD level in positive cells, and then I exclude T cell, B cell, and K cells, also exclude eosinophils and neutrophils. And then this uh, lineage negative population, I plotted it against Li6C and mannose receptors, and I found four different populations called P1 through P4. And the subsequent analysis uh, show that this P1 population highly expressed Li6C is monocyte and P2, P3 are monocyte drive cells. And P4 actually dermal tissue resident macrophage highly expressed mannose receptor and MH class two negative. And uh, I also show that they are embryonic origins uh, by performing bone marrow chimera and para parabiotic animal studies. So to, to look at their morphologies in, in vivo, I did intravital imaging uh, and then to visualize uh, dermis tissue resident macrophage highly expressed mannose receptor, I got these reagents called mannosep. They have a glucose backbone and then cross-linked to mannose and fluorescence. And this mannose moiety give us specific binding to mannose receptor and enable us to visualize uh, mannose receptor ex expressing uh, dermis resident macrophages. So as you can see these images, uh, dermis tissue resident macrophages are not motile. Uh, they are kind of steady. And then some dermal tissue resident macrophages are perivascular. And then I show that they, are, they can uptake uh, molecules directly from blood vessels. So to study the role of the dermis resident macrophage, we use a cutaneous leishmaniasis model because this model is widely have been studied 
to study the role of Th1 development and macrophage function in the skin. So uh, when sand fly uh, do their blood feeding in the skin, they regurgitate this uh, pro-cyclic form of leishmania, and then uh, this uh, parasite uh, rapidly transmitted to the macrophage and uptakes by macrophage, and they start uh, still start replicating inside of uh, phagolysosomes, and then they start life cycles. Uh, and then tissue resident macrophage are generally classified M2-like cells because we believe that they perform these fundamental roles in tissue homeostasis and repair, uh, uh, such as weight disposal. And then uh, this uh, homeostatic phagos phagocytosis of cellular materials such as apoptotic cell clearance imprint their distinct anti-inflammatory profiles on these cells. Also, I stained this uh, couple of different M2 markers in this uh, dermis resident macrophage. As I found that uh, dermis resident macrophage highly expressed these M2 markers. I showed that they are like uh, M2-like cells. So to study the, the role of this M2-like cell, M2-like tissue resident macrophage, we use a special strain of leishmania, which is non-healing strain of leishmania we isolate from patient in the conventional, conventionally registered B6 animals. So as you can see, when you challenge the B6 animal, the conventional strain of leishmania we call the LMFN, they uh, start lesions and then they start healing after 10 weeks after infections. They didn't develop any pathologies. And 17 weeks by, uh, uh, after infection, we, uh, lesion is whole, almost healed. However, this non-healing strain of leishmania we call uh, LMSD, they develop huge, huge size of lesions and then they develop severe pathologies. And eventually the, these mice are lost their ear because of necrotic lesions. When you check the Th1 immune response in this LMSD infected animal, as you can see, CD40 cells show strong production of interferon gamma, suggests that they normally develop Th1 immune response. So we wonder how uh, LMSD evade this strong Th1 immune, re immune response and develop these non healing lesions. So this is a summary of what we found. So this dermis resident macrophage highly express mannose receptor in steady states, and then they perform this uh, homeostatic function such as apoptotic cell clearance. And during infections, this uh, LMSN, they try to infect these cells uh, uh, through these mannose receptors, and they start replicating inside of cells because they are, uh, provide nice M2-like environment. In contrast, these monocyte-drive cells, they are rapidly activated by interferon gamma, and they control uh, uh, these intracellular parasites. So when we block these uh, mannose receptor-dependent infections, uh, now we found, uh, by using mannose receptor knockout animals, we found the reduced lesion size, reduced uh, pathology, and a reduced parasite burdens. Also, we tried to deplete this dermis tissue resident macrophage by blocking MCSF signals by treating them with the anti-MCSFR receptor antibody. Now we see complete depletion of uh, this mannose expressing a dermis resident macrophages, and we also saw decreased lesion size. So these data suggest that this, uh, this dermis resident macrophage provide nice, nice replicative niches for non-healing leishmania major. So next question for us, uh, how do they maintain these M2-like properties in a strong Th1 environment? So I infected several uh, Th2 cytokine uh, knockout animals such as IL-4, IL-10. I also challenged IL-5, IL-13. And then I found that in the absence of IL-4 or IL-10, and the both at the same time, this a P4, a dermis resident macrophage start disappearing and completely gone in the absence of 410. So I found that this IL-4 induced a local proliferation of dermis resident macrophage during infections by inducing local proliferation, uh, by, uh, yeah, by inducing local proliferations. And IL-10 itself is important to maintain mannose receptor expression. And T-cell is the main source of IL-10. But I didn't know the, what are the cellular source of IL-4 during this TH1-oriented infections. So I, I stain uh, IL-4 proteins, uh, and then I couldn't detect any uh, IL-4 by intracellular staining because of uh, uh, low expression of IL-4. So I exploit these uh, reporter animals 
double report animals and found that the 4% of live cells are they expressing R4 mRNA and 4% of these R4 mRNA positive cells producing proteins and some of them are eosinophils and the others are CD4 T cells. So because of this such a low expression, we assume that the, the source of our force should be in close distance to dermis resident macrophage to efficiently deliver this R4. So I did the tissue section staining uh, to, to, uh, to look at the localization of eosinophils. So purple in these images, uh, this is ear sections and epidermis, dermis catalyst, and dermis and epidermis. And purple are menos so expressing uh, uh, dermis resident macrophages, red are parasites, and the green are CGLF expressing uh, eosinophils and that is nuclear staining. As you can see in the lesion, uh, there is a close association with eosinophils and dermis resident macrophages. More surprisingly, the other side of the infections, almost 100% of our eosinophils are closely associated with dermis resident macrophages. So I thought that, uh, I, as I mentioned, these dermis resident macrophages are not motile. So they probably uh, secrete some chemokines to attract <coughs> eosinophils. So I sorted dermis tissue resident macrophage and monocyte and monocyte derived dendritic cells uh, as a control. And then I stimulate them with 410 and 410 at the same time. And then I measured the secretion of chemokines and I found a single chemokine CCL24, also known as eotaxin 2, is strongly expressed by dermal tissue as the macrophage almost at nanogram levels. And this expression is exclusive to dermal tissue as the macrophage, not monocyte and monocyte drive cells. So I tried to knock, knock out R4 in uh, eosinophils by using EOCRI, which is a uh, eosinophil peroxidase promoter driven cream ice. And I breed this EO cream ice with R413 flux flux mice to knock out R413 in only in eosinophils. And I measured the CCL24 production from dermis resident macrophages. As you can see, R4 total not deficient animals and eosinophil specific 413 knockout animals show CCL24 expression was significantly diminished. As you can see in the, in the decreased level of CCL24 induced uh, eosinophil infiltration also decreased in these both knockout animals. When you measure the number of dermal tissue resident macrophages, as I mentioned, R4 is a uh, strongly uh, induced local proliferation of dermal tissue resident macrophages. In the absence of four from eosinophils, now dermal tissue resident macrophage population size goes down However, the pro-inflammatory uh, cells like 6 high monocyte infiltration is increased. And when I measure the lesion size, both animals show decreased uh, lesion size and decreased parasite burden compared to wild time loss. Next, I sorted uh, dermis tissue the macrophage from wild type and usual field specific for 13 knockout animals. And then I did a transcription analysis, as you can see, in the absence of 413 from eosinophils, now these dermal tissue the macrophages start expressing a lot of pro-inflammatory signatures such as R1 beta, TNF alpha, NF kappa video related molecules. Not many genes uh, was downregulated, however, ex as expected, CCL24 is, is, was one of them. So summary the, the, for the part one, this embryonic drive M2 like tissue residual macrophages uh, exist in steady state dermis and they are maintained as uh, favorable ni niches for leishmania replications. And usually fields are the important source of L4 to induce a local proliferation over, of this dermis residual macrophage and maintain their M2 phenotypes. And R4 tends to stimulate dermis resident macrophage recruit eosinophils by expressing large amount of CCL24, which mediate their intimate uh, interactions with uh, dermis resident macrophages. So switching gears, uh, I'm gonna show you, I'm going to show you a little bit of unpublished data. So as you know, all know well know is IL5 is a major cytokine to activate eosinophils. Uh, eosinophils. So as I suggest, eosinophils are important to maintain dermis resident macrophages. So I measure the population size of dermis resident macrophage in the absence of L5. So as you can see, there are a decrease. 
And when I challenge these animals, IL-4, IL-5, IL-4 both reduce lesion size compared to wild type groups. So I tried to identify what are the sources of IL-5. So I, I, I found that ILC-2 is the exclusive producer of IL-5. And as Pedro showed in the previous talk, this is a well-established model for Th2 immune inductions. When allergen is helming stimulate this epithelial barrier, they start producing the three major alarming to activate, initiate this Th2 circuitries, which is IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP. But I wonder what happens during this direct thermal infections uh, by vector borne pathogens such as scent fly, which can bypass these continuous epidermal sensing and stimulations. What are the source of this alarming to activate these eosinophil circuitries, eosinophil and dermal resident macrophage circuitries? So I challenged the three alarming knockout animals, IL-25, IL-33, and TSLPR knockout animals. I found that TSLP is uh, uh, important to, to, for this non-healing response against LMSD. So to identify the source of TSLP, uh, I did the single cell tree ketone analysis. I sorted 90% of CD45 positive cells, 10% CD45 negative cells. I found that almost entire immune infiltrate in these uh, leishmania infected legions also identified these three major uh, non-hematophoric cells, epithelial cells, endothelial cell, and fibroblasts. Uh, I look at the key markers I'm interested. So mannose receptor highly expressed this tissue resident macrophage and low levels monocyte, monocyte drive cells express mannose receptor. CCL24 exclusively produced by tissue resident macrophages. IL-5 expressed by only ILC2s as expected. IL-4 mRNA is detected in mast cell, basophil, and eosinophils. Surprisingly, when I look at the uh, TSLP expression, dermis tissue as the macrophage highly expressed TSS TSLP2s. IL-33 barely detected some dots in a fibroblast. IL-25, not a single RNA molecule wasn't detected. So this is our working models. So these dermis tissue as the macrophages uh, uh, manipulate these two major players, ILC2 and eosinophils, to maintain their M2 phenotypes by expressing TSLP in CCL24. So when you uh, to get the IL4 for their local proliferation and M2 phenotypes. So when we knock out this IL4 from eosinophils, now this dermis tissue resident macrophage population size goes down, and then they change the phenotype from M2 to M1. Now I'm trying to knock out this TSLP production from this dermis resident macrophage by generating TSLP, flux, flux mice, and CCL24 cream mice, which, is, which I believe is uh, tissue resident macrophage specific cream mice. So CCL24 cream mice, I show that uh, a lot of other uh, tissue resident macrophage also exclusively produce CCL24. So these mice will be uh, useful to study other tissues, I think. So summarize the second part, by securing IL-5, ILC-2 control the activation and recruitment of eosinophils, which is a critical source of IL-4 to maintain M2-like uh, dermis resident macrophages. And among three alarmins, uh, only TSLP is uh, required for non-healing leishmania infections because TSLP is the only uh, cytokine was found to be actively transcript transcribed in L major infections and was expressed mainly by embryonic drive dermis tissue as the macrophage by non hematopoietic cells such as epithelial cells. So thanks for all the members of SAX labs and then uh, BK from uh, Dr. Kelsey's lab to help me to analyze single cell transcriptome, Olena for bio, bio imaging and then other other peoples to provide, generally provide this mice I used in the study. So thanks for this opportunity and I can, I'm happy to take your question. Sorry, thank you so much, Sam. Hello. Hello, sorry, I had to yeah. disappear transiently while my dog attacked its bowl. Um, so there's one question, but now there are two questions in the, in the Q&A. So the first is from Yang Yang, who asks, 
What are the stimuli for, for production by eosinophils in your in vivo model? Uh, uh, repeat your questions again. Is what are the stimuli for IL-4 production by eosinophils in your model? Uh, yeah, that's good questions. I uh, believe I'll, maybe IL-5 from ILC 2s maybe involve the IL-4 productions, but I'm not so sure maybe parasite can directly activate eosinophils to produce IL-4. Yeah, I'm not so sure, yeah. And then there's a second question is from Matt Wolf, who says the lesion size is smaller in the IL-4 knockout mice, but doesn't resolve as it should if the infection is cleared. Yeah. It rather reaches a steady state chronic wound. Why do you think it doesn't completely resolve? So I'm st actively studying right now because this M2-like dermis resident macrophage also important to tissue repair. So I think the reason, the, I believe the reason why they don't dissolve infections, they defect tissue uh, repair systems. So they might involve their uh, non-healed lesions too. So I'm studying right now. And, and so I actually have a question. So based on your data, should we be using anti-IL-5 or eosinophil depleting therapies as adjuvant therapy for leishmania? That's my first question. Yeah, that's very good questions. I, I didn't show the data, but eosinophils in my system, I told you they're important to maintain their niche, uh, niches, but they're also important to control leishmania infections. So it's a kind of complicated because when we use this eosinophil knockout animals, their replicative niches goes down, but uh, eosinophils killing control mechanisms also disappears. So the lesion is go worse. So yeah, I don't think it's a good option to treat these animals with eosinophil knockout or depleting. And so my second question is, have you looked at this in any other models of skin granulomas that induce a, a type one infection? So like tuberculosis or um, brucella or some of these infections that can cause skin skin granulomatous inflammation? Uh, I didn't look at the other model in the skin, but Pedro helped me to see the peritoneal infections with the, uh, in the, uh, with the Ascaris. And we saw the same, same, some same things because this uh, CCL24 from uh, peritoneal macrophages induced the uh, eosinophil infiltrations such as stuff. So it's kind of uh, applicable to the other models in other tissue organs. So for some, for some reason in Zoom, the Q&A completely disappeared. So I can't, and it's not letting me re-access. So I can't tell if there are other questions. So if one of the other um, panelists can see questions, <laughs> please um, be my guest. I don't know where they got to. There are no additional questions. All right, well, if there are no additional questions, then thanks, Seng, for a, a wonderful talk. It's really exciting to have. I look forward to the next installment. Okay, thank you. And we'll move on to our third speaker, um, Patricia Boza. And so again, thank you for, for agreeing to speak. Um, and Patricia's gonna talk about schistosomal lipids in human eosinophil activation and cytokine secretion. So you can go ahead. Uh, let me try to, to share my screen. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, by thanking Dr. Amy Cleon for this kind invitation to participate in this webinar. It's really nice to be able to uh, to have the society together in these difficult times and to keep uh, discussing roles of eosinophils. Um, so can you see my, my screen? Yes, it looks perfect. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, so today I'd like to share with you some uh, of our studies concerning uh, the roles of uh, schistosomal uh, components uh, in regulating uh, uh, the host response 
So today I'd like to show uh, our data on cystosomal lipids in regulating humors and a few activation and cytokine secretion. So um, there is a, a, a remarkable accumulation of tissue and blood eosinophils that are characteristics of cystosoma mansoni infection. And indeed, from the beginning of the studies with of the eosinophil field, eosinophils uh, have been uh, shown to kill uh, the cystosoma mansoni both in vitro and in vivo. Uh, and for that, it has been suggested as important uh, defense uh, mechanisms against the parasite. However, this concept has been challenged in uh, recent years by the demonstration that cystosoma mansoni infection in different mouse uh, models uh, found to have limited or no uh, effect on uh, protecting uh, from the warm uh, burden. However, um, based on uh, the, uh, the view of fusinophils as uh, immunoregulatory cells with very important roles in hemostasia and in the control of tissue uh, uh, repair. Uh, it is important also to consider the immunoregulatory roles in, uh, in the interplay with uh, helminth infection and uh, eosinophils may play uh, modulatory roles in maintaining TH2 response to infection via cytokine secretion and may also contribute uh, to cytokine mediated uh, pathogenesis. Uh, in this figure uh, that I borrowed from a very recent uh, review, uh, 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 by Dr. Amy Klein, uh, that I really recommend you all to, to look. Uh, here it shows that uh, eosinophil uh, recruitment and activation uh, in uh, response to helminths uh, involve a very complex network uh, of host-derived molecules that in to include uh, tissue-derived uh, stimuli, TH2-derived uh, cytokines, ILC2-derived cytokines that would uh, lead to activation and recruitment of eosinophils, mostly IL-5 uh, and geotaxin uh, play major roles on those processes. And uh, upon the tissue, uh, eosinophils may participate uh, both uh, in host protective uh, mechanisms or uh, in immunoregulatory mechanisms uh, towards the, uh, the infection. What I would like to uh, call up your attention today is to the roles of parasite-derived molecules in regulating uh, eosinophil activation uh, during uh, uh, this uh, interplay with the parasite. So indeed, it's uh, uh, cystosoma mansoni are a very um, uh, complex parasite. It's a multicellular parasite uh, that has evolved different mechanisms to uh, their long live uh, within the mammalian host. So different components of the parasite either secreted components of the parasite or, or uh, uh, molecules expressed within the tegument are able to regulate both the innate and the adaptive, uh, adaptive immune system. Uh, so down-regulating the host response uh, enable their uh, survival in uh, within the mammalian host. Uh, those involve the uh, uh, effects on uh, tolerogenic uh, dendritic, dendritic cells, M2 uh, 
polarization of macrophages as well as induction uh, of uh, different programs of the adaptive system, as well as negatively regulating the TH1 response. Um, and indeed, several of the Cystosoma mansonii products has been uh, suggested as immunotherapy for uh, immune diseases. So our group are interested on the roles of uh, uh, parasite-derived lipids to modulate uh, the host immune response. And indeed, parasite, uh, the Cystosoma mansonii, uh, have a very complex array of lipids, uh, both uh, within uh, the tegument of the uh, adult worm, as well as in, uh, in the egg, and uh, as secreted extracellular uh, vesicles enriched uh, with lipids. Uh, a couple of years ago, we've uh, demonstrated that lipids extracted from uh, the adult worm or of the egg uh, were able to stimulate uh, macrophages towards uh, T uh, TLR2 dependent mechanisms. Uh, and that uh, main component of those lipids were uh, uh, lysophosphatidylcholine uh, present, present in the worm. Indeed, uh, phosphatidylcholine is the main lipid present in the tagment and can be uh, also be secreted uh, as uh, extra um, uh, cellular vesicles. So uh, we've demonstrated that uh, uh, Cystosoma mansonii uh, induced uh, um, eosinophil uh, recruitment and lipid droplet formation through uh, TLR2 dependent mechanisms, and that is uh, uh, shown here uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this panel, uh, uh, as well as to modulate uh, the schistosoma mansonii uh, uh, granuloma. Uh, we went on to show that uh, uh, lysopc are able to polarize them to, uh, macrophages toward the NAMI2 uh, phenotype, uh, inducing uh, increased levels of IO-10, TGF-beta exhibiting increased expression of arginase-1, and mostly those effects were due to LPC. And indeed, in vivo, uh, uh, lysopc derived from Cystosoma mansonii are able to induce eosinophil recruitment in vivo in mouse uh, as shown here and that in a mechanism that were dependent on TLR2, uh, as well as induce activation of the eosinophils measured by increased lipid droplet formation within the eosinophils. And uh, this uh, phenotype occurs together with an increase in IL-13, IL-5, and the otaxin uh, production in the inflammatory sites that were also TLR2 dependent. So that opened up a question whether those uh, uh, lipids from Cystosoma mansonii would be able to directly activate human uh, eosinophils. So uh, we went on to perform experiments uh, using uh, total lipid extract or uh, liso, uh, liso PC uh, derived from uh, adult worms uh, to trigger uh, eosinophil activation that could be seen here in this panel that indeed the stimulation either with uh, total lipids or liso PC could trigger uh, um, lipid droplet uh, activation in the human uh, eosinophils uh, and that would also occur 
uh, together with an uh, enhanced expression of TLR2 uh, in those cells. And we were able uh, to demonstrate that this effect was indeed highly dependent on the signaling uh, towards TLR2, uh, both uh, with the total uh, lipid spread as well as uh, lipid, uh, the lysopsy induced effect. Uh, we could also observe that uh, uh, the increased expression of ADRP, that's the main uh, structural protein uh, within lipid droplets that are newly formed. So we went on to see uh, other pathways involved in this uh, activation of eosinophils by the uh, uh, lipid derived from Cystosoma mansoni. And uh, we uh, were able to uh, observe that lipid extracts from the adult worm, they contain uh, prostaglandin D2. So we asked whether uh, PD D2 from the worm could signally uh, eosinophils for its activation. And indeed, by using a specific antagonist of uh, PGD2 receptors, uh, we could see here that uh, total uh, lipid extracts from Cystosoma mansoni were inhibited by DP1. Uh, uh, antagonists, uh, thus indicating that uh, indeed the PGD2 in the worm were also able uh, to signal uh, uh, activation of the eosinophils. And in this case, uh, the uh, inhibition, uh, the use of the uh, PGD2 receptor antagonists were not able uh, to uh, modify the response by LISOPC, thus indicating uh, two different signaling pathways uh, of eosinophil uh, activation by lipid derived uh, uh, parasite, uh, uh, lipid derived uh, components from the parasite. And indeed, when we looked uh, uh, a combination signal, uh, uh, from uh, uh, by uh, using uh, small amounts uh, 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 of PGD2 or LISOPC, we can see an, a synergistic effect of those components demonstrating that those lipids uh, from the parasites are formed by different uh, uh, array of lipids capable to synergize for uh, eosinophil-induced uh, activation. Uh, so uh, next, uh, we went uh, uh, to look um, if uh, li uh, the lipids from the, the worm would be able to signal for uh, eosinophil-induced uh, uh, pro-inflammatory mediator secretion. We first look to the capacity to uh, produce lipid mediators upon stimulation. And eosinophils are known for their capacity to produce high amounts of LTC4. And indeed, eosinophils stimulated with arachidonic acid induce high amounts of LTC4 and low amounts of eoxin. Uh, that is a 15, a low derived uh, mediator of the arachidonic acid pathway. However, when we trigger uh, um, eosinophils with lipids from Cystosoma uh, mansoni, we can observe that uh, both total lipids as well as lysopc trigger preferentially 15, a low derived mediators with a, a, a shift towards the production of aoxin when compared uh, to their capacity to produce uh, LTC4. So uh, we went on to demonstrate that indeed uh, there is an increased expression of 15 uh, LO, the enzyme triggered by both 
uh, Lyso PC or the total lipid extracts. Uh, this uh, production of aoxin is highly dependent on uh, 15 LO, and it is almost completely inhibited uh, by the treatment with uh, 15 LO uh, inhibitors, as well as the capacity of PGD2 uh, to trigger uh, aoxin production was also uh, inhibited uh, uh, by uh, the 15 LO inhibition. And again, when we looked for uh, the capacity of uh, LPC to trigger eosinophil dependent activation, we see that this effect is highly dependent on TLR2 uh, dependent mechanisms. Uh, so we went on to demonstrate that those eoxin are being formed within lipid droplets in those eosinophils as shown here by uh, those, uh, um, there's a causa cell that uh, um, identify eoxin at their site of production. And uh, as it's been uh, previously demonstrated, uh, by uh, Dr. Peter Weller and uh, collaborators, uh, the, uh, there is pathways uh, that are regulated by um, uh, leukotrienes uh, and other eicosanides to uh, drive vesicular transport and cytokine release by eosinophils. Uh, and uh, here in this panel, uh, um, the demonstration of LTC4 form the lipid droplets leading to IO4 release uh, by uh, eosinophil granuli. So we've asked if there would be roles for 15 low derived uh, mediators in regulate cystosomal uh, induced eosinophil cytokine secretion. So uh, we've uh, looked Tower the, the secretion of TGF beta by uh, the eosinophil. Uh, and as shown here, uh, eosinophils are able to uh, store in their granuli uh, large quantities of TGF beta. And indeed, by stimulating eosinophils uh, with cystosoma uh, derived lipids, we observed a rapid. Uh, 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 secretion uh, of TGF beta uh, with the depletion of intracellular stores of TGF beta and the release uh, of extracellular TGF beta measured by ELISA here in this figure. Uh, and again, this mechanism is highly dependent on 15 load uh, mechanisms. Uh, interestingly, uh, eoxin itself uh, 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 could also uh, trigger uh, uh, the release of TGF beta, but since it's a downstream uh, uh, of the 15 LO, it, it is not sensitive to 15 LO inhibition. So collectively, uh, our data indicate that Cystosoma lipids contain at least two components that are capable of direct activating human eosinophils. Uh, Lyso PC acting uh, through TLR2 dependent mechanisms and PGD2 acting mostly uh, through DP1 uh, receptors. Uh, and that triggers uh, the induction uh, of uh, lipid droplet biogenesis, uh, enhanced capacity of aoxin uh, production, uh, and that is crucial to uh, regulate TGF beta formation uh, by those cells. So uh, by identification by bio uh, bioactive cystosomal lipids and mapping their, uh, those lipids may help understand the schistosomal pathology and also may lead us to new insights on molecules that can 
uh, have immunoregulatory functions uh, uh, and also to regulate tissue fibrosis. So I'd like to finish by thanking uh, the collaborators in this study, mainly uh, Cristiana Bandera Mello, Peter Weller, and work was uh, developed mostly by Kelly Magalhães, now a, a independent research in the University of Brasilia. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for that really interesting talk. There is a question from Steve Ackerman. Um, he asks, eosinophils express at least two different lysophospholipases, a 75 kD and a 21 kD enzyme. Have you investigated whether these play any role in degrading the S. mansoni derived LPCs involved in eosinophil activation? Yeah, that, that's a, a very interesting question. No, we have not looked for the, the phospholipases in this uh, context, but it would be very interesting to look at. I had a question kind of along the same lines. Do, would any lysophospholipase do the same thing? So have you looked at, at um, I'm sorry, would any, I'm losing my mind, would <laughs> lipid from any do the same thing. So have you looked at non-schistosomal lipids or, or different types of lipids to see whether, whether this is really unique to the schistosome lipid? Um, so those, um, the, this, um, so lysopc can be uh, also produced in other contexts and for other parasites and, and that would also trigger eosinophil activation in M2 uh, derived macrophages. Uh, so we've looked, uh, when we look the total lipid extracts, we search for other lipids. And uh, so lysopc was the main molecule that in our search, we're able to trigger uh, the TLR2 dependent activation. So we could not see the same for other lipids present in this crack. So uh, uh, we did a fractionation of the different uh, components of the schistosomal lipids. And even if we look for, uh, like say, uh, arachidonic acid, it gives a different pattern of response from the, uh, the lipid extract. So it seems not to be a common, that a common thing that any lipid would, de, would do the same um, uh, mechanism of activation of those kind of fields. Are there, so I, I'm familiar with the filarial parasites, obviously, and they have lysopc, but do, is this a very, is this very broad across all helminths and do non-helminths do this as well? I was kind of thinking back to Sang's, uh, when you started talking about the, the data on CIS-LTR and IL-4, I was thinking back to Sang's talk. Mm -hmm. And so people don't often think about these pathways in terms of their effect on eosinophil secretion of cytokines and modulation. And so I'm just wondering how generalized this is. Um. So um, it is, we haven't looked in, in Flaria, but uh, it is not unique for uh, Schistosoma mansonize. Other parasites would use that same uh, uh, parasite derived lipids to modulate the host response. So Ticruside do, does also uh, uh, produce and secrete uh, uh, Lyso PC that can modulate the response uh, of the host. So it seems to have uh, different parasites can uh, modulate the, uh, and modulate this, um, uh, uh, the response and towards uh, uh, a regulation, monoregulatory effect of the host. That's really interesting. So for those of you on the call that are non-parasite people, so T. cruzite. <laughs> Anasoma cruzi, and that, that would be a protozoan parasite that has very, a very different life cycle and, um, however, is also common in Brazil, or was. Um, are there other questions either for Patricia or I guess we have 10 minutes, so um, I'm happy to open up questions for other speakers that, that got cut off early, so um, feel free to... 
ask other questions. Looks like there's Florence. Hello. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. That was really very, very interesting. All very different talks, all, all around eosinophils and how they interact with parasites and interesting cell types. Um, I think there aren't any more questions. Uh, I've checked the question and answer box a few times. There's nothing, I think there's nothing new in there. Obviously, if someone has any other questions that come to mind, I'm very sure that the people who presented today would be happy to answer through email or whatever. Um, so I think it's time to close this webinar. This is the last webinar uh, before our summer break. I'd like to thank everyone for participating, the speakers, our moderator, uh, and all of the people who've attended. And um, just like to inform you of a few points, um, you will probably be receiving uh, by the end of the day, if I'm not mistaken, uh, an evaluation form. And if some of you uh, could take the time to fill it in, that would really be helpful for us to organize our future webinars. We really plan to continue with these webinars uh, beyond the end of this year. Uh, we will be continuing into 2022, so any opinion uh, or suggestions for future topics are really very welcome. Um, the next webinar will be held at the end of September, uh, Wednesday, September 29th. It's actually going to be an abstract uh, session for trainees. We have had uh, quite a few abstracts that have come in. We're in the process of, um, of rating them. And then uh, we will, I think we're going to have a very, very interesting abstract session. So please attend. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be fun. Um, and I think that with this, I have no other specific messages. Uh, we are continuing with our program. And so more information about the topics that have been selected until the end of the year can be found on our webpage. And um, I'd like to wish you a happy summer, everyone. Thanks to everyone again for attending. Thank you for moderating, Amy. And thank you for speaking, everyone. Florence, before you before you go away, the one thing that I would say is so hopefully there are parasite eosinophil people on this call who may not have known about the International Eosinophil Society before. We are planning, we do have, we have in the past had meetings every two years and we are planning a meeting for next year that hopefully will occur. Um, you should think about joining the society. It would be really nice to have a stronger parasitology presence at the meeting. I think that there are a lot of things that we can learn from eosinophils and helminth infection that actually have application to other eosinophilic disorders and vice versa. Um, it's a very- uh, Absolutely. Broad, very broad and, and I can- and I can actually highlight that uh, the fact that trainees are being offered free membership right now. So this is really a good time to join our society. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Amy, for that last comment. Have a nice, have a nice day, everyone. Bye-bye.